Greetings and welcome to What's Wrong With Wolfie. My name is Jason. And I'm Rich. And I'm Chris. And we've reached the video games of 1998. The world of video games in 1998 was an incredible time. We saw a might of critically, critically acclaimed games release, including Spyro the Dragon, Zelda Ocarina of Time, Metal Gear Solid, Pokemon Yellow, uh, Banjo-Kazooie, Castlevania, Sympathy of the Night, Half-Life, and Signs of the Dreamcast starting to show, with Sonic mm. Adventure 2 being released in Japan. When you include our picks, 1080 Snowboarding, Resident Evil 2, and Grim Fandango, you can see how much gaming was evolving in the late 90s. And before we jump into our picks, why don't we have a little chat about that, guys, and you know how gaming was changing at this time period. Like, we were seeing, you know, we're going from, like, I don't know, Yoshi's Island on the SNES to, to Resident Evil 2 in, in just a matter of a couple of years. And, like, it, the gaming, this is probably, like, the start of, like, the gaming world becoming that little bit more... Adults, wasn't mm. it? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Yes. With ever since like the advent of like the PS One, I think it just it gave it gave gaming like a whole new feel and vibe, and it felt more like you felt more movie like, not in terms of like realism and visuals, but yeah, themes. Tone, yeah, that's that's wasn't. funny enough. In in my in my notes here is just like also the the addition of spoken word into a game. <laughs> Whereas before we just had voices was a wasn't a new thing in ninety eight, but it was kind of new enough <laughs> to make yeah. you fully immersive rather than reading subtitles or or just not reading any at all with no dialogue in the games, just having like scene settings and stuff. But yeah, yeah. the storytelling became so much more immersive it because was- of that. I think. Yeah, it was really like starting to. They were really starting to aim to for video games to be more movie like, weren't they? Mm. Than what we'd seen in the past with video games, and obviously in the intro there, I mentioned like Metal Gear Solid, which is the prime example of a video game trying to be a movie and and tell this extravagant story, which was something you know we we'd never really seen before in a video game, and it opened our eyes to what what you could do in a video game and the stories that you could tell. Yeah. And, it, and it's only mm. ever evolved from that point to where we are today. Where, I mean, I know I've experienced some of the most uh, powerful and emotional stories through video game. Yep. Yep. Completely agree. Um, yeah, I mean, the particular series for me is definitely the Yakuza series that like, has put me into actual like month long depression because of, <laughs> something that happens to some of the characters I love. It's like, yeah, that's what games are now. It's, it has been for the longest time, but we're not just looking at sprites and primitive sounds and colours and power-ups. It, it is genuine storytelling on a like you know prestige TV movie level. It's, yeah, very lucky to have that, I think. Yeah, I mean, mm. and obviously here in 1998, we, we've still got, you know, well, I mean, when you look at 2022 eyes, and you look back, you know, it's still quite primitive 3D graphics. Mm. And, you know, even like the the spoken dialogue, it, the sound bites are still a little bit off. You know, they, they still don't quite sit in yeah. the game completely. But, you know, if we didn't have this, in, if these games hadn't come out in this year, and, you know, in even like Resident Evil 2, one of our picks as well, you know, what, what a story that that told. And, We'd never, yeah, again, we'd never really seen zombies being, yeah. well, not properly, you know. I guess when I look back and you think about Doom and Wolfenstein and all those kind of violentish games. Zombies ate my neighbours. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we've seen them in the previous scene. We've seen, like, developers try to do more adult games, but never had the technology to really fulfil their ideas and... Yeah. Um, thoughts and it was I mean, and I think it was this year that they that it, it kind of started filling the potential yeah because I think with like the popularity of things like Resident Evil obviously a knock-on effect you got like your Silent Hills you just kind of snowballed from there um, 
I still remember playing the first Resi for the first time. Obviously, I know we're going back a couple of years, mm -hmm. but I was already a zombie fan at this point, you know, watching George Romero movies, mm -hmm. and I still remember that first cinematic in Resident Evil when you come up on the zombie that's eating... Um, we always forget the guy now. Is it Brad or whatever? Whoever the first guy is, he's been eaten by the <laughs> zombie, and the zombie kind of turns around and gets up. Yeah. And that feeling of actual, just pure actual dread, but in a game, not the scene of a movie, and knowing that you basically were in control of the fate of that character mm -hmm. as you were like backing away, and that the camera angle changed and the zombie came into the shot, just was like, this isn't a video game anymore. And it felt uncomfortable to play. Yeah. I almost wanted to switch off because it just it triggered my anxiety at that. You know, we're still young, still getting used to those kind of experiences, I think, in games. And yeah. it probably made me just want to pop the disc out, put it back on the shelf. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 it's yeah so amazing. Pivotal point in, in video game. And then I guess the only thing that really took us out of these worlds that they were trying to put us in was loading time. So. Oh, yeah. <laughs> No. <laughs> we got Dreamcast. It's just like <laughs> taking me out of the experience now. Yeah, just no, like, right. yeah I, I was a PC gamer at this point as well, so it was just oh. a standard. Just like, oh. this yeah. cannot be read. Oh fuck <laughs> off! <laughs> I was going to forget what game it is. I'm sure there was a. I'm sure there was like a Dreamcast game. It was like a survival horror. I don't know if it was something like um, D2 or something. I can't remember. But any time there was like a jump scare, anything would jump out the game would just kind of start to load it in. So literally, right okay. as you had a jump scare, the game would... completely... I appreciate it. Thank you very much. You've primed <laughs> I, me for the jump that. scare. Like. Yeah, when I was playing you know, Tomb Raider and stuff, uh, you know you're approaching, approaching the end of the level when you hear the, yeah. the drive read more data. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and yeah. you're just like, what's going to happen here? Is this the boss? Is this some... <laughs> like... <laughs> It could be incredibly reassuring that we also fill you with immense amounts of dread. Like, oh, great. Now <laughs> what? Or, the, or in my case, yeah. when you hear the fans kick in. <laughs> <laughs> like, shit, so it had to go down. Yeah. Fucking, uh, awesome. Okay, then, well, let's get into our picks for 1998. And I'm going to kick off the proceedings with my pick. And for for my video game of 1998, it had to be Resident Evil 2. going on i arrived in town and the whole place went Great. insane the radio's out you're a cop right yeah first day on the job great huh name's leon kennedy nice to meet you mine's claire claire redfield i came to find my brother chris you open the glove box? Sure. There's a gun inside. You better take it with you. Ah! No! Look out! You okay? Still in one piece. I'll meet you there. Okay. So, as I've mentioned before, I was late to the PlayStation 1 as I chose the Saturn over that. So when I finally did, I made sure to pick up Resident Evil 2 with it. Based off the high price I had heard of the game, I was intrigued to experience the survival horrorness. And I was surprised with myself. As I've also mentioned on the podcast previously, I never really went out to seek horror. Never was one for that kind of thing back then. Um, but based on everything, I, you know, the high praise and everything that the game got, I, I was intrigued enough to, to, to give it a go. And um, as soon as I was started playing, I was in. I was in. I couldn't stop. Um, you know, I, I loved the option to choose between characters and learning the game. I had different stories for both. It was, in, it was really incredible to me. Um, I, I never really experienced that before and obviously 
I chose Leon to start and it was just, just an experience that I never really forgot um, to experience this like dark and mucked up world. But not only was it my first experience of survival horror, but I think it must have been one of, if not my first experience of like true real zombies in a game. And that on itself fascinated me to the point that now I, I love that kind of apocalyptic kind of zombie world, you know, like the worlds that the walking dead mm. built and all that, that kind of thing. I, I've, when I've watched other films that are kind of apocalyptic, they that don't have the zombies. They're, they're still, I still find them good things to watch, but the, 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 the secret ingredient for me is the zombies. And then it just takes it up to it to the next level. And then when you, when you add in the, the exploration of the police station and that was just great. I mean, that, I just loved that kind of game when you're you're exploring a building or, or or a close environment, you know, and something that's kind of real that you don't really necessarily have an opportunity to explore in real life. You know, where where are you in, norm, in normal life are you going to get to explore a police station? You, you're not, are you? No. Um, so that that made it even more fascinating to me to play the game. And uh, even the sewers at the end of the game, um, I quite enjoyed exploring all that and trying to solve the puzzles. And the the plot of both characters were really good and tight and well written. And yes, I even liked Mister X and the tank controls. Yeah. It was all it was all still an incredible <laughs> package to me. And uh, like we said, you know, the the gaming world would never be the same again. Just a just a, an incredible world, and like hearing that clip back just a minute ago, just kind of emphasised what we said as well at the beginning of the episode with like the 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 voice acting. It really yeah. stood out that this was kind of like the, the the one of the first points of, of video games where they were putting in proper voice acting, and you can hear how 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 little wooden it is. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it still feels cheesy, but you actually put it up against. Resident Evil from like two years prior, it's it is night and day. Mm. Resident Evil is just like absurd. <laughs> yeah, I think this is Chris's blood. It's like what? <laughs> uh, how how do you know? <laughs> it's, it's like, and it's just yeah, it's still cheesy. But hearing that clip back as well, it's, it's there was nothing where I was like, oh god, oh god, uh, yeah, burying yeah. my head in my hands like <laughs> how just OTT is and yeah, it's. Definitely, things evolved around this time. Yeah, but um, you know, do you, have you like? I, I believe you've played the remake of Resident Evil Two, haven't you, Rich? Yeah, completed. It's the first, and well, actually, yeah, one of two Resident Evil games I've actually played and completed. Um, I did play the original first. Mm -hmm. I think originally it was probably like a demo on a PlayStation Mag, um, and I, yeah, I'm not going to make any. I'm not gonna it's no secret I don't like traditional Resident Evil games because of those tank controls. I mm -hmm. find it unplayable and clumsy. Yeah. Sue me. Uh, <laughs> but I really did love Resident Evil 2 at the time. As I mentioned earlier, I was a big zombie fan already at that point. I was on a on a hearty diet of George Romero and your Italian zombie movies. Um and although the first Resident Evil had that more kind of cliche kind of haunted house kind of vibe even though it was zombies mm. what i liked about resident evil 2 was that it had that more contemporary in the city yeah larger scale vibe to it it felt more grounded instead of just lots of little wooden you know hallways and corridors and mm. you know cobwebby you know just it felt more haunted house the first one yeah. this felt more on the street you're getting the scale of the actual epidemic and the the carnage, the burning cars, you know, you've got the zombies just kind of wandering down alleyways and the basketball courts mm. coming in through the, the gunshot window. It just felt big and more exciting and more scary. Um, and for that, I loved it. I never played a great deal of it. Again, I've never, it's not just, I don't really like the Resident Evil games with the classic controls, but I, because of that, I never really get very far into them. Yeah, just, it, it doesn't gel with me in terms of my ability. Yeah, I just uh, 
But, just a bit slow, isn't it? Hard to yeah. react to certain things on the screen, and then you're, yeah. you're fucked, I mean, that, and that's it. Yeah, I mean that's why I absolutely ate up. I won't go on about the remake because that's not from 1998. But that's why I <laughs> love that over-the-shoulder third yeah. person. Yeah. It it charts all the events of the original game, but it gives it to me in a in a form that I can consume. But mm. it's not taking anything away from the original. Even though I never really cared for the series, I always been excited just at its existence. I mm. love that it brought like zombie zombies to the mainstream in gaming form. Mm. Um, I even remember the the Japanese TV commercial for Resident Evil Two, like the game, um, was actually directed by George Romero. Oh, that's such um, a nice touch. Capcom, yeah, Capcom <laughs> actually threw some money at him, and uh, it's crazy. It's just like it was like literally like ninety second TV spot. Some Japanese actors dressed up in proper, you know, Claire and Leon cosplay. But George Romero was behind the camera. It's just mad. Absolutely mad. And I, I always remember seeing that in the gaming mag, just being excited, thinking, oh, we're going to show it on TV over here. But yeah. of course not. But. Uh, I wish we were a video podcast sometimes, just so I could play that one instead. But I just think a, a yeah. jumble of Japanese Japanese talking on the podcast probably is not gonna really going to work too well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> What about yourself, but, Chris? Have you ever had an experience of a Resident Evil 2 or a Resident Evil game in general? Um, not really. Um, I just... It was one it was one of the things I just wasn't really interested in when I first sort of gaming in the mid-late 90s. I played them at friends' houses, but I never sought it out myself because I think I was still finding my, my horror feet, as it were, at that point. Yeah. And also, I I was more into puzzle solving games and stuff like that. And it's lots of puzzles are know, a thing, Chris. <laughs> no, you know what I mean. Like, <laughs> yeah, they're, like, they're awful puzzles. The, the, I would say that. The, sorry, Jason. The they're genre sorry. of the <laughs> horror game <laughs> wasn't wasn't something I was interested in. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why. I've played it obviously Resident Evil around my friends, but I never deliberately went out to buy a copy and play it and see what it was like. I just wasn't interested in it at the time. Mm. And even now, I I don't think I've played anything remotely like Resident, more well, Resident Evil related anyway, mm. ever. Obviously, yeah. played the Last of Us, the first Last of Us, but yeah, that's been about it really, to be honest, with that kind of survival game. And it's Naughty Dog pulled off a lightning and a bottle moment with the Last of Us, and I really enjoyed it. The whole walking around gathering scraps to build stuff and survive i loved it and i've been thinking actually for the past couple of years actually to go out and actually play a resident evil remastered but as yet hasn't honestly happened. yeah do two you'll love it and then three is nice because it is more like a tomb raider game it's just an action mm. boom 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 you just it, the pace of it's really nice so if you're not necessarily a survival horror fanatic it's a nice I don't, way I don't mind in them. yeah just I just one of those things that are completely off your radar until yeah. a conversation like this comes up and you think, actually, no, I've not got around to it yet. Mm. Play early in isolation, Chris. You'll thank me later. Or, <laughs> yeah. or you'll want to kill me for <laughs> recommending that game to you. I, I, <laughs> so I, I did that with Last of Us quite a lot of times, playing to like 2 a.m. on your own, Ugh. headphones in, mm-hmm. yeah. lights yeah. off. I was just like, yeah, <laughs> this is awesome. Loved it. Yeah, you got. Um, yeah, you should definitely go and, and check some of them out. You have got a great oh, catalogue yeah. of games just sitting there waiting to be played, and mm. um, even like the more modern, up to date, you know, Resident Evil Village and all that. And I you know, it was that still. Yes, yeah, um, you know, I, I kind of dipped out the Resident Evil series for five and six, and um, I went back for seven, and that kind of got me back into the franchise, you know, because it's just just on another level, you know. And mm. and, and eight is uh, is a great game, you know. I really enjoyed that too, but. Um, we're not here. We're not on prepared fast forward, unfortunately. So, uh, <laughs> but, you know, but you know, like um, yeah, going back to Resident Evil Two, and and I think uh, one of the other things we quite liked about the game was the uh, infantry. To a certain point, you know, it got a little bit frustrating when you found uh... all these kind of in- great objects that you wanted or or thought would be handy, but you just didn't have the infantry space. Another thing I don't like about the series. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> oh no! Look, all these green herbs and red herbs, and I need room for this key or this <laughs> clip. It's like for, for 
for fuck's sake. <laughs> because because also, also, I know you find those boxes around you yeah, can store stuff, say, yeah. which is nice. But yeah, it's nice to have those. But you're like you're constantly going backwards and forwards, aren't you? And then me being me, and like I'm putting the wrong key in the yeah. storage box, and then going back, and then oh, <laughs> there's a wrong bloody yeah. key, and then I have to go back and get the right key, and <sighs> this, that, and the other. But you know, and even even the puzzles of the game were quite interesting to try and solve, even though. You know, I'm not the greatest puzzle solver, if you like. Um, yeah. When we come to I'm talk sorry. about Chris's pick, um, that's going to become quite evident. But um, it was still quite fun to find out the ingenious ways in which you had to solve some of the puzzles. You know, you had to find these, like, keys and put them in these statues to open a doorway and this, that, and the other. Yeah, it was, I, those ones always made me chuckle. It's like, you know, put the green jewel on the tip of the statue's penis mm-hmm. to <laughs> raise the staircase <laughs> like okay who thought this through like yeah. whoever was the architect of this building is insane so yeah. it's like this will do it's like why <laughs> it's like it's yeah it's strange but but you know and anyways. and um i even mentioned him a little bit in my intro and you know with that kind of marchy kind of i don't know what kind of music accompanies mr x when he's starting to chase you around the police yeah. station but yeah. um it, it's fun for a little bit, but then after a while, it does get quite annoying and frustrating because you just want him to sod off because you just want they to stay, concent- concentrate yeah, they stay on what you're doing. They stay true to that in the remake. They stay true to that. You just yeah. dickhead. Seriously, it's like, <laughs> go away. Like, please go away. Yeah, because hey. especially, like, I think a couple of times I, I was, like, close to solving uh, the puzzle or whatever I needed to do, and then, like, the music started kicking in, and then, like, ah, oh, crap, he's getting close. And then, like, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to go and run around the police station again just to try and evade him, so I can get back to finishing this. Yeah. And uh, it was just a bit. I guess it, it kind of like took you out, didn't it? It kind of just, yeah, put put you off playing the game a little bit, I guess, because it was taking you away from what you was really trying to trying to trying to do. And um, yeah, it, agreed. Yeah, still love him though. Right, Especially when like, you're someone like me as well, I've got a terrible sense of direction in games. So if I'm making yeah. progress somewhere, <laughs> then I have to double back and run because he's coming after me. I yes. then have to think, right, where the hell was I 25 seconds ago? <laughs> yeah. Where Which the hell am I, I now? <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. And I can't read this map because I'm an idiot. And <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's like, oh, thanks for that, mate. I was doing all right. And yeah. <sighs> did you um, Did you ever like try to run away from him and then open a door and then walk into like a couple of zombies? Like, oh, I'm fucking now I've got to deal with these guys within running behind me. I don't think I had that, thankfully, so that's good. Oh, okay. so, that's just me then being lazy and not getting rid of them when I probably yeah. should have. Okay, well, um, yeah, that's my that's my pick of uh, 1998. Let's move on to um, Chris's, which um, uh, video game. Pick. Yeah, what was your pick, mate? And, yeah, as I was a PC gamer one, anything in 98, I think, it's a game <laughs> that's actually found a lot more love recently called Grim Fandango. I was once a reaper like yourself, Manuel. But I uncovered a web of corruption in our beloved Department of Death. Hector, no! It looks like I've got one of your boys down here in the morgue. Tell me, Manny, would I have had a chance? (laughs) You gotta watch your step around here, stranger. Rubicabi, the quaint little port town she used to be. I've got to get back to the city where the action is. Manuel, are you in love with her? Love? Love is for the living, Sal. I'm only after her for one reason. She's my ticket out of here. Now, it's a weird one. I remember getting the demo disc for this in, I think, PC Gamer. And I was just like, what is this? This looks quite cool. Stylized, you know, skeleton people. And this is awesome. And I fired the demo up and I was just like, this is amazing. The music, the atmosphere, the, the voice acting is just bang on accurately. You're there and it's just so irreverent. It hurts sometimes. <laughs> um, but it's basically your bog standard PC adventure game with skeletons. <laughs> and, um Again, like we said earlier, it's extremely cinematic from like its first scene. You're hit with this like film noir vibe. So it's just, it's just making me laugh just talking about it. And this is where good games and good films and stuff, this is where they give you a long-lasting impression for the rest of your life because it just stays with you. Basically, 
You play a character called Manny Calavera, uh, who is a Grim Reaper. However, <laughs> he <laughs> uh, works for a Department of Death selling afterlife travel packages to dead people. Nice. And he wears a cloak and a stil- and stilts <laughs> while selling. Comes back to his office, takes off his stilts and hangs his cloak up. <laughs> it's just like... He turns from the Grim Reaper within seconds to just a normal guy with a suit doing a day job. And never since Beetlejuice have I understood the land of the dead more <laughs> than playing this game. <laughs> it speaks on that that very... Like... It's uh, like like what Coco did and Beetlejuice did before it and a lot of Tim Burton's actually and uh, Paranorman from Leica Studios. They they portray the afterlife as the most colourful, adventurous, happy, musical existence. And I like that. It's a bit of a disconnect and it establishes like the, the land of the living. That's the grey, dreary <laughs> existence. You're now a fun land. And it plays so beautifully well as a batshit insane 1940s set film noir crime drama game. It's basically a click, a click, like, um, like Telltale Games. And you just sort of click an adventure, and it's just the story just captivates you. Because A, it's within five minutes, you know exactly what's going on, and this is just crazy. I'm actually what in this world of basically a Grim Reaper doing a day job, and he's fed up with it. But then comes across corruption within the uh, Department of Death. Now, if you play the game or look at clips on YouTube, there's plenty of them. And I think it's even... Didn't they put a remastered on Switch, which I found out earlier today? Yeah, I almost bought it at one point, but it never happened, so... but Yeah, yeah I, they have, they have I forgot it existed on Switch, because obviously I've only had a Switch for well, not even a year at the moment. And the, the film noir narration over the top of some of the cinematic scenes and even some of the gameplay gives off so many amazing Frank Drebin vibes <laughs> that that's what you think about. You just think you just take it easy because it's not a it's not a game you take seriously. It's just so fun and insane at the same time. Now I have a um, problem with Grim Fandango. Um and it's not anything that you've said about it because it's it's a highly regarded game and you know there's there's lots and lots of people out there that love this game and I understand the reasons why. But for me personally, and this is the same for other games of this genre, the whole point and click mm-hmm. thing. And I I enjoy point and click games to a certain point, um, but they're too clever for me. Um, yeah, I, I I am not. Um, I don't know. I, I don't. I don't obviously have the brain for these kind of puzzles that they put into point and click games. To the point that when I do figure or not figure when I do look up the answer to, to, to the puzzle. And I, I would have never, ever thought of doing that at all. And it, even now, like I played uh, Thimbleweed Park quite recently, which is, um, it was in a sale on the, on the Switch. So I picked it up, I heard good things. And it is a true like point and click game. And like some of the solutions are just so like absurd that I would never have cl- connected the dots to be able to carry on with the story. And I think, and that obviously boils back from, from these kind of days with these kind of point and click games. So yeah, if I'm, I'm just not clever enough for them. No, if I remember rightly, the original was uh, tank controls. It's the remastered. That is the point and click version. If I remember rightly. I can't remember. I, 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 remember. So I remember being able to sort of walk around the, the world and stuff and, but it's been um, many years since I played it. I haven't played it in twenty years, easily, <laughs> maybe more. I kind of remember playing it once, and I think I got out of the building that you start in, and you mm. got onto the street, and that was it. <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out anymore from that mm. point. I'm like, do you know what? This is like, this. This is obviously a game that I'm not ready for right now. So I'm just gonna put it down and walk away, and maybe come back to it another time. But yeah, it was just really weird because to this day, it is the only game of its kind I think I've played like I don't know if I know completed it I'm talking maybe 99 I had the full game 
Um, yeah, so over 20 years ago. Yeah, I mean, I, I played Monkey Island, uh, one of them anyway, because like you say, at this time, as you, as yourself, Chris, I, I was getting into the PC games as well. You know, this year as well, I was playing Half-Life on the PC mm. and and getting into games on, on, on there as well. And I, I, I dabbled in Monkey Island as well with the same kind of... I, I kind of got more into Monkey Island than I did with Grim Fandango. I'm not sure why. Maybe I just resonated with that that storyline and that uh, place more than I did with, with, with the characters mm. in that game. I don't know. But I still got to that point where I'm like, I can't figure this out anymore. It's just, I can't figure out why I need to take this banana and put it in this hole to get this item to take and, <laughs> you know what Sorry. I mean? Get this fish to but, yeah. uh, to feed it to this seal who who will then do this yeah. so then I can get to that point. And yeah. I, I mean, like, what attracted me more to this was just the sheer irreverent subject matter. Not hmm. subject matter, uh, idea behind it where hmm. you, can t- you can have any film noir game. Yeah. You can have any you know, detective-oriented game, whether it be dressed as Batman or an actual film noir game or something like that. But I think what attracted me was the whole, like, Land of the Dead kind of thing. And I remember seeing it in PC Gamer going, that looks quite cool. And then I saw the trailer and then the demo disc. And I was like, I think it was more of the structure of the game, the way it was made and presented. And and the cinematics are amazing. They're colourful. They're, they're almost lit like proper film pieces that's what i said in the opening where this we're on the cusp of now games becoming small cinematic pieces i don't know what attracted me to it i think it was just that that brand of humor was mine my favorite brand of humor at that time yeah, yeah. and you you kind you of know, uh the the, the right uh, uh timothy schaefer he you know he's he's a legend in the gaming mm. world and he, yeah He's kind of had his fingers in lots of other similar kind of games, working mm. for Lucas Arts, and now he works for like Double Fine, where he's uh, he created Psychonauts and Psychonauts Two, which are uh, two really good exceptional games. So I've not played two that much, but I played one last year, I think, and for the first time, and it really like blew me away with the ideas that they that they put into that game. But, yeah. Mm. He did the uh, same with uh, Brutal Legend as well until it became a uh, RTS yeah. and it put me off. So, but yeah, yeah, the first half of the game fantastic. Had, I didn't know he was part of Brutal Legend either. <laughs> yeah, he was like the actual. Yeah, he was like the man behind it. So, and again, yeah. a game that I only played the demo version of. Yeah, you played the, you played the good part, and then it became RTS. Because <laughs> I remember, I actually <laughs> remember. I as my brain's like a hard drive, as you people <laughs> unfortunately found out, <laughs> I remember actually you, you and me, Rich, talking about that game, where everyone yeah. was massive Jack Black fans at that point, but early 2000s. And like, what is this? Jack Black's voicing a game and he's got music featured from <laughs> all these different oh, amazing artists. And it was just like, what the hell is this? And then I played the demo, I think, actually around yours, Rich, I believe. Yeah. And I, I never, never bothered to play it, <laughs> like ever. Um, yeah, you know, and he, he he's uh, helped co-design Day of the Ten- Tentacle as well, and assistant designer on the Secret of Monkey Island and Monkey Island Two, um, and uh, uh, Broken Age as well. He was he helped to design Broken Age games as well. So, Why is that he, so familiar? I think. That's kind of a similar kind of style, okay. Point and clicky kind of game. I think I'm thinking of Falcon Age, which is a very different game. So you know me. <laughs> yeah. it's got way, it's got the word age in it, so that'll, that'll do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But a different game. Ignore me. Yeah. <laughs> but what about yourself, Rich? Um, I mean, do you have any experience with this game at all? Mm, not really. Not well. Not at all. Um, even this genre. The only time I've ever played a point and click game was the demo for Broken Sword on the PS One. Oh, okay. Um, which I think was on the demo one disc when I got it for Christmas that year. Yeah. Um, that that pulled me in, even though I wasn't necessarily massive on the gameplay. Like the cinematic scene, all that hand drawn animation on a game was like, whoa, this is amazing. Yeah. But beyond that, the genre just never appealed to me. Monkey Islands, Grim Fandangos. I remember 
when Grim Fandango was coming out, I had a friend who was quite excited for it. He was very much PC back then. I, I wasn't at all. I was in 64 at that point. Mm. And I remember seeing like, previews of it on like Cybernet back on ITV and yeah, two in the morning. <laughs> and uh, so the game was on my radar, but it just, yeah, beyond that, I've never played it. Mm. Yeah. I, I might like it. Chris making those kind of parallels in a way with like Beetlejuice kind of makes me think, hmm, okay, maybe, maybe. But I don't know. It just doesn't appeal to me, I guess. Yeah, there are some supercuts on YouTube of the gameplay, and someone's edited it into like a full, perfect kind of like movie. It's like <laughs> like two hours. You can have it on in the background, and even just doing that, it's one of those games that when I was revisiting it just on just on YouTube alone, yeah, I was just like, this sounds amazing. Like, yeah, the sound design. The sound effects, the speech, the music. The music just makes you feel like you're in a smoky jazz club in like the 1940s. You know, and you've got like his lovely like new age jazz. And it's got like Mexican guitars and his lovely music nice. going all the way through. And there's so many different styles that are thrown in as well. That you don't nice. realise until you listen to the isolated uh, soundtrack or watch the... Um, the videos on on YouTube, it's it's one of those things that when you re, when you watch, you have more appreciation for just for the visuals, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I think it works better like that. A lot of people have done different versions and different edits, but the music alone is just worth it. It's just, I mean, I don't know who the composer is, but it's just, it's great. I feel like it just I sounds knew, but... <laughs> great. It's just like it's like I get like so I. I I compared it to Beetlejuice earlier, and it's very similar. Where basically you put the humour of Columbo into the underworld of Beetlejuice and make them Grim Reapers doing their day job. Okay, so you kind of pitch. that's that's the kind of if I was pitching that game in '98, that would be like look, it's <laughs> it's crime solving, but yeah. with Grim Reapers, but they're doing their day job. And then when they you know they're on stilts and walk with their cloaks and their scythes. And they then they sell travel packages as a day job. It's so it's it's almost <laughs> you could almost see Seth MacFarlane doing it as a gag on Early Family Guy. <laughs> yeah, it's that kind of caliber of joke. But again, just just the the production value. It looks and sounds stunning, especially the remaster. People have been up like you know proper like 1080p 4K transfer. It just looks amazing now. I haven't played Remaster yet, but, but again, yeah. I might not. I might not. I just remember playing it late at night sometimes in my own little world, you know, when I was, when I was just 98, so I was about 14. So yeah, it's like. Um, Schaefer opted um, to give the conversation heavy game the flavor of film noir set in the 30s and 40s because he thought there's something that he feels was really honest about the way people talked that's different than modern movies that time period would you agree with that chris mm. yeah it just i just have it's one of those one of those games that I always have it's not not so much happy memories it's pleasant memories and it makes me not want to play the remastered version i, I think i think you're safe with the remastered version just on the fact that they kept the game uh visuals and everything mm. kind of the same and I think that that is the jarring part sometimes when when old you know one of your old favorite games has received the the remake or whatever and it looks completely different or they've made too many changes to it. But from, yeah. from what I've seen and from what I've heard from the remake, they've kept you know they've they've kept it you know as as honest to the original as possible. They've just given it some quality of life updates and obviously cleaned it up and, and given it a a, mm. a better frame rate and stretched it out to widescreen and all that kind of stuff i believe i've not I played might, it myself I to, yeah I, I might have to give it a go but i remember the past well today really like watching youtube videos so i just i actually found myself properly like laughing at some of the gags mm -hmm. that you probably never got as a child as a kid or a teenager and then you get in now as you're an adult and you think fuck like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, definitely. But you definitely. appreciate it more when something lands so beautifully, insanely, cleverly, and you're like, "Whoa!" <laughs> like, I don't know. I'll play it again. It might not. It might be a thing that I might not be into now. It's just 
it was just my kind of humour at the time, and I think I just gravitated towards it because it was death and <laughs> macabre stuff. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, well, let's move on to Rich's pick. What was your video game of 1998, Rich? My pick was uh, 1080 degrees snowboarding on the N64. There we go. When I decided to train for this, I heard it all. Jehu, you fool, this is a desert. Jehu, it's 110 degrees. Crazy things. I practice around five, six hours a day with the rumble pack. On the slopes, in the half pipe, Jehu is there. It's very spiritual. Just you and the mountain and the snowboard and the game. 1080 snowboarding only on Nintendo 64. Real close to the real thing. I warn you, snowboarders, watch out for Jehu. Is that, is that problematic? I don't know. <laughs> like, I have no idea. <laughs> I've never heard of that. I thought he was going to play like a song or something. Yeah, work your body, work sure. your body. I was going body. to, and then I, I, I found that advert on YouTube, and I was like, oh, wow. that'll do. And then okay. um, I, I did it all, and I listened back to it again, and I heard that ending, and I was like, I don't know if that's all right. But I'm going so with it. Wasn't it so. one of those, clearly it wasn't one of the American ads they didn't show over here, because Nintendo were marvellous with their marketing at the time. They would just recycle US commercials for the uh, European market, but I never saw that one. So, cool. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it, as you can tell, it had that kind of Arabic Arabic, Arabic yeah. vibe to it. You know, it had a camel in it and uh, <laughs> and everything else. I don't know, they were just twisting the world, you know, to uh, make snowboarding, yes, yeah, like snow, irony. and then he's in a hot place with no snow, and it's just got Fair sand. Point. Fair point. Yeah, it was the 90s, man, you know. Yeah, it was a different time. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, the reason I chose this game, it obviously came at a time where this whole like genre was getting quite big with the Tony Hawk series. You know, a lot of these things were popular on the PlayStation, but what really jumped out to me with this was that it was so completely not Nintendo. I mean, it was a first party game. It was developed. It was published by Nintendo. Shigeru Miyamoto was, the, you know, at the helm of this game, ran on the Mario 64 engine. <laughs> was he? I, I never yeah. knew that. Yeah, this is, this is a, this is a Shigeru Miyamoto joint. It's I crazy. I never knew that. It's crazy. And the composer of Mario Kart did the soundtrack for it. Um, and it was programmed by two British guys. That was it, two guys. Um, I never and knew that. Just, yeah, no. yeah, I know. Even that, when it came kind of, out, I remember. And it kind of blew me away because, I don't know, like, I'm, I'm never really into the... I'm, I never really really got into the, the these kind of games. and Yeah, I, I never really that. paid that much attention to it because of that. And I never really realised that it was that involved with Nintendo and, like... yeah. Miyamoto and all that kind of stuff. It's really cool. Yeah, yeah. This was um, Shig Z did it. So, uh, <laughs> and it's, you, you can see it. It's got that real just mark of quality to it. It, it, yeah, it's it is a it's a first first party N sixty four game. It, it always they have that extra level of quality. Um, what really stood out to me with this one is that kind of what I said earlier. It, it wasn't your typical Nintendo game. It wasn't, you know, I know it sounds cliche now, but yeah, it didn't have that cute, quirky kind of charm to it. It was very grounded, quite gritty in terms of characters were fully realistic human characters instead of just like, you know, humanoids or cartoon characters. It had real life like branding in it. You had like Lamar snowboards, Tommy Hilfiger. It felt like a PlayStation game that was actually on mm. N64 that was published by Nintendo. Yeah. Because at the time as well, I think there was a part of me, and it sounds quite lame, but I gave up my PlayStation to get an N64, and one of the things I missed was that vibe you got from PlayStation, whether it's Wipeout, whether it's... Um, well, that's probably the best example is Wipeout. I mean, even other series similar to this, things like your Cool Borders, they never nailed it like this game does it there's just something genuinely cool about it visually it looks realistic and it feels realistic the soundtrack's just really goddamn cool um it just didn't have that cutesy soft colorful charm to it which is what you expected yeah um the controls it uses the you know the n64 controller in a in a ingenious way it's simple but you hold down the Z trigger to crouch, you release it to jump. It, it's just, it just works so well. So holding down a face button, it just feels intuitive, kind of like 
when you're using it as the trigger for Goldeneye. It just feels like it's made for it. Mm. And that's where you kind of appreciate it for all its flaws. That's why that controller just felt right. Having you know, the, the trigger be centered as opposed to what we're used to now where it's left and right. It's, it just felt... Yeah, it felt like you actually were... I don't know the best way to put it, really, but it felt like you had one-to-one, one-to-one control of that person's body. Like It felt like you were doing the moves. Um, it didn't feel disjointed in any way. Um, visually, this game is stunning. It still holds up now. Um, you've got like the dusk and the sunsets, the the sun, like the reflection on the snow and the ice... Even in the controller, like the resistance on the stick, not the physical resistance. I know it's you know this is a bit more of a primitive time, but how smooth your character controls if they're going through like thick powder or going through like compacted snow or mm. God forbid ice, it feels different. And the way the rumble pack feeds back, it feels slightly different. And I'm not. This is, I know this isn't like a haptic feedback or you know HD rumble. Sure. This was more yeah. primitive, yeah. but compared to other games you played at the time on the N64, it felt more dynamic. It, you, it was genius. Absolutely did, genius bit of game design. Um, did you, you kind of get? I suppose you didn't kind of get different rumbles, did you? Either from different kinds of snow. Not really. <laughs> it, I think. Maybe if I just picked it up now and played it with an actual native controller and a rumble pack, maybe I would notice it as much, but it really felt like it then. It felt like the rumble felt more <laughs> loose and understated. If you're going across ice, it felt more like you were skating along something, and then when you went through the thick powder or hit a log, you had that more that more jolt to it. Mm. It felt more aggressive. Um I think we probably don't give a lot of these older like rumble packs and your vibration packs on the uh, Dreamcast, for instance. So I don't think we guess you probably give them as much credit as we probably should do. Then, then it's just like, oh, the controller's vibrating. But yeah. it's surprising how good they are. Like I was playing Res recently on the Dreamcast, and mm. the feedback on that is insane. It's really like, good, isn't it? Yeah, one to one with the music, like the bass line, the beat. That's right. It's not yeah. just boom, 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 boom. It's genuinely. The way it's like it's just an, like an attack in your senses. The way it's vibrating is just so in tune with the music and what's happening on screen. And I feel like 1080 kind of have shades of that. Um, was this like and, was this like one of Nintendo's like first game? I mean, it had licensed music in it, didn't it? It didn't have licensed music. No, it was all done by the composer. I forget his okay. name. Now, was a composer for Mario Kart. And obviously, you had the the joys of cartridge compression as well. So, mm. but yeah, they did they did have their own soundtrack in it. So it was kind of it was kind of poppy in a way. There was some more like you know those kind of nice aggressive um, N sixty four guitars that you used to get. Kind of like you used to have the really like scratchy music on the Mega Drive. There was a trademark sound for like electric guitars on N sixty four. You know it when you hear it. Yeah. If it was very processed, very like lo fi, mm. it, it works. And they've got some like vocals in it, like kind of sampled loop, looped vocals in some of the songs. Yeah, I was listening to a few back on YouTube earlier yeah. when I was looking for the clip I played. And the, even like the title sequence has got Oof. vocals in it. The most incomprehensible song. <laughs> yeah, you like, couldn't understand much about it. It's like, what the. <laughs> fuck are you singing right yeah I was, even now i smile at that it's just like i don't know what this is is this is it a language thing is this compression is this japanese is this english i don't know is it even a language on this planet but i do love it but some of the other songs are good there's like there's one song that's kind of your typical kind of 90s like it's like a song like an answering machine kind of thing like this little like interludes you used to get on like britney spears albums it feels kind of just really quirky and poppy and there's another one that's you've, you've got the classic one when you slit your character and you know the work your body work your body it's like, that's the classic one mm-hmm. and it, it sounds clear it's got a nice fidelity to it it's really impressive on by cartridge standards and again like i said visually it just looks the part it doesn't it doesn't give up anything in terms of how it captures realism it really just it's the nearest we've got to PlayStation Call, I think, on N- on N64 outside of yeah. Wipeout 64. That came like the same year, probably a little bit after. 
Yeah, it just it it really does have that visual style of a PlayStation game. Yeah, but smoother and <laughs> kind of blurry up, but not and, as pixelated. And no loading times. <laughs> and no loading times. So, <laughs> but was this like was this like one of the first snowboarding games that had been made? Because <sighs> I feel like it was a sport that hadn't really been like. I guess it probably has been in the past. I'm sure when you go back to Commodores and Amigas, I'm sure there has probably been snowboarding games. But I, I don't know much snowboarding at those times because you think about it. I mean, that era, I don't know if snowboarding was even popularised that much. You had like skiing stuff. You had your winter games. I mean, I'd like, I played winter games on the Commodore um, Plus 4. Um, but I never remember snowboarding. I, I I feel like the first time I ever remember a snowboarding game was Cool Borders on the PlayStation. Mm. Um, and they weren't anything to really write home about. This one just, it was a snowboarding game that had that Tony Hawk appeal. It just mm. felt so polished, so right. Mm. It just handled perfectly. It was cool. Um, I don't think it had the same like cachet as Tony Hawk, but that's probably a lot of it to do with it being on the N64 as well, which didn't mm-hmm. have that same kind of reach as the PlayStation. Um, do you think that's yeah. why they, they haven't made another one, have they? Yeah, they did, they did 1080 Avalanche on the GameCube, which is fucking fantastic. Mm. Um, it has, it has licensed music in it, a lot of new metal as well, which I appreciate. So, <laughs> again, another Nintendo game, and it's like they got like songs by. Boy Hits Car and Seether on it. I'm like, hell yeah, dude. I know these bands. <laughs> yeah. These are from my years growing up. Yeah. Um, that, that game's fantastic. It's got it's got a bit more of a... It's not cutesy. It's still kind of realistic, but has a bit more... A bit more of a smoother edge to it, should I say, than the N64 one. But it's still a very un-Nintendo Nintendo game. But it's fantastic. Worth playing. Um, but they haven't released one... To get it. Yeah. Uh, I, um, but they haven't released one since then, have they? No, no, definitely not. Um, I think really since this, I think your real standout successes were like the Amped series on the Xbox, um, which was great. Amped on the, on the Xbox, the original one was fantastic. It's something, I don't know what it is about snowboarding games. They kind of get me like football games do. I have no interest in the actual pastime or the activity. Anything to do with it in the real world, but put a video game in front of me. I just sang about it. I just I eat it up. I know what you I don't mean. Know what it is. I know what you mean. I've, I mean, I don't have much interest in like golf or tennis, but then yeah, uh, give me a golf game or a tennis game, and I'm, yeah. I'm quite interested and, and I quite enjoy yeah, playing. I it. know exactly what you guys mean with that. It's so weird. <laughs> yeah. I don't it's, it's I remember, because I know I'm never going to do it, so I feel like I'm getting it out of my system. Like but, I'm uh, cool on the slopes. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but isn't that what yeah. all gaming's about? We know we're not going to live through a zombie apocalypse, but <laughs> mm, <laughs> yeah. we don't know. Well. <laughs> And anything's hey. <laughs> anything's game these days, isn't it? Anything's is game. It? So yeah. who knows? But I mean, like, I guess the only sport is someone trying to get me to play a cricket game. I think even mm. that well, I'll draw the line on that one. Sorry. Oh yeah, it's boring. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, Not what's going on there? No. So, um, uh, Chris, I assume you you haven't had much experience with with 1080. Uh, yeah, I think I brought it up on one of the other recordings. I think you used to play quite a lot, me and my brother. I had it on the N64. Still got it, actually, I think, in the loft somewhere. Uh, many, many happy times on that. But again, I think with snowboarding, like Rich said, the mechanics a bit cutting through the snow. And it doesn't look as boring as a skier. Mm. Nowhere a skier could be standing up and, you know, skiing and ski jumping. Uh, a snowboard, it just has that that movement like a skateboarder yeah. on the snow. Going downhill, that was like, wow. Like, <laughs> And I remember playing 1080 around a friend's house before I even owned the game. And I think I got a game from a friend anyway at some point. He was getting rid of his N64. And I just remember going like, this is quite cool. And like Rich said, it just worked. It just Everything about the game just worked. You, you know, you're doing the jumps and just... Yeah, it's been a long time since I played it, but I do remember playing it. And I, oh. I'm, I'm, I'm quite intrigued because I never played the game. So, um, <gasps> I thought everyone I, would I ne- play 1080 snowboarding no, well, somehow. Said, even then, I was like, like I said, even even then, I was like, I'm not really into the snowboarding thing. I, yeah, I'm just gonna go and play banjo kazooie, I think, or whatever. 
um, yeah. you know. Um, so yeah, I've never really experienced it, you know. So like, was it hard to pull off the moves? Or I mean, I assume like you had to do like some assaults or flicks. Or- yeah, it's, it's all your timing. It's all your nail, you know, nose grabs, tail grabs. I mean, when you, like I said earlier, you hold down the Z trigger, you you crouch, you release it to jump. You have to angle the board, otherwise you just yeah you. Know, you you just absolutely eat eat shit, basically. Um, mm. It's no different to playing a, ten, a Tony Hawk in a way. It's the same principle, you know. It's all about your angle, your landing. But yeah, you do all the your grabs. Um, your typical, you know. Um, I'm gonna really piss off a load of snowboarders now. You know, you're, <laughs> I, I, you know, I can't name any moves. So I'm not gonna pretend. Uh, I'm not hip. I'm not, you know, fresh. What do they call it? Um, we st- I don't is stale fish one I don't know I know it's a snowboarding move, but <laughs> it's it's your tip it's a typical extreme sports game. You've got your ramps, you've got your jumps, you come off, you go off cliff edges, which is obviously a hazard in itself. You have to hit the landing right. Mm. Um, it's, it's just so good. You get shortcuts. You know, it's just it's just so good and it's one of those things as well it's very competitive like if you race against like the ai for instance there's no like rubber banding in it the winner of it will be whoever's better if you eat shit early on they go off into the distance you will not win the race it's just you versus one other person and yeah you have to get it just right so it's difficult in that regard but yeah it's no different to playing like a tony hawk really but on snow Beautiful. I thought Chris was going to name Rail off all the moves then, mate. Oh, Chris. Yeah. Who, me? Oh. No. Yeah. I don't know. Same move. <laughs> I remember you playing an obscene amount of Tony Hawk at friends' houses, though, at this time of year. Tony Hawk, At time of, oh. like, oh. like, many house parties, you're there till, like, 4 a.m. Hmm. Oh, what we were doing, you end up, like, oh, just play Tony Hawk for, like, three hours. Oh, my God. Okay, some of the moves are the same. You've got your nollies, your yeah. ollies, your melons, indies, no grab, tail press, nose press. It's all basic stuff, really. I don't think it has anything to do with whether it has wheels or not. It's all about grabbing no. the board. Um, also, there was an unlockable in this game as well. You can actually unlock a penguin. And it's not <laughs> an actual, <laughs> like... You're not riding on a board that has an image of a penguin on it. You're actually riding on the back of an actual penguin. Is it a Mario um, penguin for Mario 64? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, afraid not. <laughs> if I remember rightly, it's a quite realistic penguin. I have to do image search. I don't think I actually have unlocked this penguin. I'm not going to lie. I don't think I did. So, sorry. I'm going to do this live on air. No, that's it's fine. I'm, okay, uh, it's quite cute and animal abuse. So, that's good. I'm uh, I'm on eBay <laughs> doing live shopping, looking at the, the 1080 uh, Avalanche on the GameCube and seeing how much that's going for these days. Avalanche is kick-ass, seriously. And uh, Because I do have a GameCube. Um, I don't have an N64 anymore. So, um, But I do have the GameCube. Um, there's one going on a starting bid for five pound. So, Ooh. yeah, I find 1080 does go for quite a bit, but um, sometimes you get lucky. It's not as expensive as Snowboard Kids, which for some reason, inexplicably, that game goes for a shitload of money. I don't know why. <laughs> some people say it's the best snowboarding game on N64. I tried it out. It was all right. It wasn't mm. 1080. No. Um, also, this game, for the last thing I'll say about this game, is home to like the. Maybe until. Kazuma Kiryu in Yakuza, it's home to like the coolest video game character ever, with uh, Kensuke Kamachi, who's just this really badass looking Japanese dude with bleach blonde hair, nice red and white Tommy Hilfiger jacket, black beanie, coolest dude ever. When I saw him for the first time like, in 64 Max, I was like, you're cool, I want to be like you one day. <laughs> Love that dude, he's so Ooh. badass. You see yeah. him in like, the character's select screen, you highlight him, he's like, yo, he just sits there like, yeah. <laughs> still a badass I love him every time I see the screenshot if ever I play that game I'll always play as him I won't play as mm-hmm. um, Brad Winterborn or whatever his name is <laughs> or any of the other characters they're kind of lame I know you mean so it's like he's, he's, he's my main it's like Axel in Crazy Taxi I don't play as BD Joe piss off yeah. like, yeah, like, Axel. like when I used to play Micro Machines so I was always Spider exactly it's yeah. cool man it was, cool. It was yeah. the Fonz you know exactly <laughs> exactly but, yeah. You sold you sold me, Rich. I feel bad for ignoring this game now. It's and, brilliant, and uh, I, I do. I feel bad that I've. I, I feel shamed. You've shamed me on the podcast it, that I have not played the game and I need to rectify it. It's still I was very shocked well. when you said you hadn't. Sorry, Chris. I was just very shocked when you just said you hadn't played 1080. No, I was under the impression that a lot of people <laughs> had at no, least played it for an hour or two. It, it just wasn't my thing then, and. I was more into pl- uh, platforming and 
uh, 3D exploration games, you know, like Mario 64, Banjo. And I said I was yeah, doing a lot of PC games. I was playing Half-Life and uh, get, getting into Quake 2 and those kind of games on, on the PC. And it, 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 I just looked at 1080 and I was, it's not my game. So I just mm. ignored it. And I've never really paid much attention to it since, to be honest. Sure. And it's I, and I just, one of the best games. And I just never knew it was so involved in the Nintendo heritage, I guess. Or, and yeah, I just, I'm just, I'm shamed. I'm sitting in the corner with my little. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it's similar to me as well. Yeah. Some, a lot of the games <laughs> that I have played that I have become a fan of, I never chose to look for. Yeah. They're always through friends or family. So, have you played this? Have you played that? Yeah. Oh, I've got my Game Boy down. How do you play this? You know, chuck this cartridge and see what you think. And next thing you know, you're like, oh, I really, I really like this. And like, <laughs> even at that at that time, you know, I, I was just starting to earn a wage in '98. You know, I'd, I'd left college by this time, so I had a, I had a job in the local res- uh, pub restaurant. So I was earning money. I was earning wage, but you know, there was there's only so as far as it would stretch and. Unfortunately, it didn't stretch enough for 1080. So, yeah, <laughs> we'll, leave, we'll leave it at that. But yeah, I, 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 if, I might put a cheeky bid on that one on eBay and um, get some snowboarding action into my life, and maybe uh, I'll be able to realise what I've been missing out on all these years. But remember as well, it's coming to the. Uh, um, is it coming to the Switch Online? Line? Yeah, it's like next oh, it month. Is. I think. Yeah, and um, I, I get okay. it. It's not a native, but it more or less is. It's not like yeah. it's a remaster. I've got my N64 um, controller downstairs for the Switch, so... I think it comes in the first round of games on Switch Online, so I will definitely be playing it again, you know, a bit more polished than uh, playing on that janky old controller. So, uh. <laughs> yeah. In fact, oh. I might have to raid my N64 games, because I'm pretty sure I've got games up there, probably 1080, that I forgot I even own. Mm-hmm. Are they I'm still sitting me. in your love, Chris? Yeah. Oh, you need to get them out of that blooming loft, mate. They're all going to get damp. I, I have my N64. No, no, they're all properly wrapped up in various mm-hmm. layers of damp-proof stuff. Mm-hmm. And okay. again, I've got my 64, my golden eye tie in 64. And then in a couple of old like, ice cream tubs, mm-hmm. I've got, must have at least 15 games up there. Okay. And I'm pretty sure 1080 has got to be one of them. I don't know how I came across it, but... I'll have, have a look. Yeah, because I, I got a friend and he, he used to be really into the video games and he's still got a lot of the old stuff like Mega Drive, Mega CD, he's got a Jaguar yeah. um, and all that. And he had he he had it all in the loft, but he got them down once and we looked through them and like they'd started to, like the, the instruction books and some of the cardboard and all that were, were curling and like you could see like oh, where no. it started getting a little oh. damp to it and stuff. And I was like, dude, you know. <laughs> I have to go up in the this loft is, now, Jason. This is not you put good, a fear man. into me now. <laughs> yeah, no. it's not good at all. But yeah, 1080 snowboarding, lovely. Well, what a what a lovely bunch of games that we chose for 1998. And like I said uh, at the beginning, you know, and it was quite a tough choice considering the amount of great games that um, that got released in 1998. So mm. uh, yeah, it's ridiculous. It was, it was it was far from a lean year. <laughs> we were, we were eating well. Yeah. That time it's ridiculous like. just like now really you know maybe too too much yeah. now but maybe yeah well that's it i guess um that's your lot for for this week and uh, the video games of 1998 thank you all for much for joining us and listening in and uh if you've enjoyed what you've heard and would like to support us then we do have a coffee page where you can give us a one-off tip or if you're feeling kinder a monthly tip starting from just a pound a massive thank you to all who have done so your legends and if that's not right for you right now you can also support us by giving us a review or rating on apple spotify or Podchaser. and it not only i don't think it really helps the show get like discovered into like apple's featured pages or anything but it does help other people decide on whether they're going to listen to us or listen to somebody else so um well i mean we do have one lovely written review on on the apple podcast right now but it would be lovely just to um, just to see a couple more uh, pop up on there, just, just for that reason. Well, it's always it's always nice to hear that we're doing well. If, if if you could spare a couple of minutes to do that, we would really really appreciate it. You can find the links. I put all the links to the to our Apple page and our Spotify page and everything like that in the show description. So uh, go and have a look and click on those links, uh, and that's the easiest way you can do that. Or you can go and check out our website where you can find the links for that and a lot more 
uh, included on our coffee page. Our entire cat back catalogue of episodes are on there. And some written articles written by my fair self are still on there to be read, uh, including the latest one that I put on there a week or so ago on my favourite indies that I played at EGX. I should, I, should, I should probably write something. I will do that. I promise. Yes. Yeah, yeah, me, me too. I keep meaning to, and yeah. the weeks keep flying by. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's, uh, it's easily done, isn't it? But, uh, yeah, you can find all that at wolfypod.com. Next time next time uh been looking forward to this one we have something very special to celebrate uh, the spooky season and our halloween special so uh, I'll, i won't say any more than that and uh but please look out for that in a couple of weeks time chaps it's time to say goodbye 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 all. my name has been jason dom it's over to you well that's it for another episode of what's wrong with wolfie boys are off now to hit the roulette table with Patricia Routledge. See you later. What's wrong with Wolfie? I can hear him barking. <laughs>